Welcome to the Masterworks Museum. Today you will learn about four incredible monuments, from the cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde in the United States, to a pre-Incan temple in Peru, to the ancient capital of Thailand, and the stone sculptures of Mount Rushmore. On your journey, you will traverse 3,000 years of human history. In the first room of the museum, you can hear about world heritage and how this experience was created. Then, continue on to the four exhibits where you will have the opportunity to explore these amazing places. Your goal will be to find and listen to audio clips from historians, archaeologists, and scientists as you unravel the mystery of who built these amazing monuments. You will also collect artifacts to transport to other locations as you piece together the challenge these sites face today. Good luck and safe travels on your journey through history at the Masterworks Museum. So yeah, hello and welcome back to Illegally Sighted. This is Jesse, aka BGFH. And uh, as you can tell, we are in a VR experience here. Uh, educational one, which actually sounds rather interesting to me. Uh, this Masterworks, I keep wanting to call it Masterworks Theater, uh, or like, you know, what was it? Masterpiece Theater. Um, <laughs> but it's Masterworks, um, a journey through history. And yeah, so we have these different, we're in this museum here. Nice little loading space uh, lobby thingy here. And uh, <clears throat> we have different things that we can teleport to and look around so um you know I, again i want to show not just gaming content but some of the other cool uses that we can do with virtual reality um so i can't move oh okay i guess i can move <laughs> oh okay that's turning okay uh so i didn't have to crane my head around here um but we're yeah we're looking around here in this uh, museum and we are going to learn a little bit about history. I don't know that we're going to go through everything in here, but I want to show you what this app is like. And uh, again, another nice, relaxing use of virtual reality uh, and for education. So basically, I can uh, snap turn here. And when I hold either one of my triggers, I get this little beam. Now, I can't teleport anywhere in the room so it's not like a free teleport but you notice if i touch this it turns green that means something i can interact with now it isn't now it is we're gonna go this here for now uh i gotta th i gotta figure out how to okay you just click at it so okay. welcome to unesco welcome to the house of culture. Welcome to the house that protects world heritage around the world. Okay, Our program, the World Heritage, uh, was created over it's 45 years ago to protect the wonders of humanity. And as of today, we've been able to identify, list and protect over a thousand sites, 1,073 to be exact, as of 2017. Hmm. Our program protects cultural heritage and natural heritage. For cultural heritage, we have a very vast array of sites that range from archaeology to urban sites to monuments to cultural landscapes. And for nature, we have also a very large typology and types from oceans to mountains, from geology to biodiversity. This is the treasure of humanity. This is what we need to protect with all the energies that UNESCO and the international community can put forward to establish mechanisms to help countries, to help NGOs, to help all those who care about the heritage. It is a very important task. The future uh, generations will be able to enjoy what we enjoy today if and only if the international community, with all the forces possible, public and private, uh, with all the energies of the young uh, and the old generations, uh, we'll be able to protect them and preserve them as they are. It's Makes not sense to an me. easy task. There are a lot of challenges that are in front of us. For instance, cultural sites and natural sites are threatened by urban, urban processes, the growth of cities, the growth of infrastructure, 
by climate change, by many disasters that are happening. Uh, these threats are serious. The threats are with us. We have to confront them. We have to m enable the sides to protect themselves, to adjust and adapt. So I don't know if I want to watch this whole thing. Let me see if way, I can... limit. Yeah, we'll back out here. So I, we're not going to look through the whole... That's just basically a uh, 360 video kind of a thing. Let's actually look at some of the... We got one, two, three... One, two, three here. And then I want to see what this is over here real quick. Oh, neat. Welcome to Mount Rushmore, located this... in the Black Hills region of South Dakota in the United States. Oh, cool. As We're you explore here. the site, look for artifacts and audio clips as you discover the history and origins of these massive stone sculptures. So I've lived in North Dakota, I've lived in Minnesota, and I have not gotten down to Mount Rushmore. But this is pretty sweet. We're actually looking out from between two heads. Ow, oh, that's big. Uh, let me turn around here. Huh. Okay. So... Um, this was the one I was really most interested in because Mount Rushmore just seems like a really cool, cool place. Okay, so those are anywhere I can go there, I can teleport. Um, artifacts. I just want to see, like, what I have to trigger here. So we can get up close. Huh. So if there are things off in the distance, low vision wise, it's going to be a little bit hard to see what we're pointing at. Uh, let's see, so that brings up options. Okay, so everything else, the A, the A and the X buttons or whatever, the triggers, all of them bring up the teleporting stuff. And I would like to go down because I'd like to like see this from way out so I don't there's like these glowy things here I'm not quite sure what that means hey buddy <laughs> so I can teleport oh so it's only a certain distance oh I see Okay. Uh. You're not going to let me teleport any further? Looking for, like, audio logs or something that they were telling me about, because I would like to learn more hmm yeah so I can walk out here but I don't know how Unless you have to find certain things and do them in order first. Yeah, all the buttons do this like the same thing. Huh. I mean it's cool, but I'm trying to figure out exactly what is it what is it I'm supposed to do. So we've got a pillar out there. I wonder if that's like a 
teleporty thing, like I, like major scene changes that I could do. Ah, no. Okay, I did. What the hell? I did. Now that's moved over there. Uh. Oh, oh, okay, uh... Carved into the face of the mountain, this enormous stone sculpture features the faces of four U.S. presidents. Washington, who led the colonists in the Revolutionary War and helped lay the foundation for American democracy. Jefferson, who authored the Declaration of Independence and was responsible for the Louisiana Purchase. Roosevelt the populist who led America's charge into the 20th century, and Lincoln, who freed the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation and fought to preserve the Union during the Civil War, each of them among the country's most iconic and important. Okay. Okay, so... Um, visually, it's a little weird. So that's the same thing we've already seen. And if I aim at it, like it's not, I don't think there's different options, is there? Or can I... Hmm. So we're stuck out here. V I mean, visually, this would be... Um... I mean, I like what this thing is trying to do, but as a low-vision user... Um... You know, there's not really good head tracking as far as being able to some of the menus and some of the dialogues and stuff are, you know, they're not close enough or large enough to where it's easy to see. So at any time I can bring this up and, oh, okay. Um, I don't know, I just clicked on something. Okay, good. We're back to where we need to be. Let's check out this first... Oh, okay. So, can I... Okay. We can watch movies about it, and then we can explore, maybe. I think that's how this works. Welcome to Mesa Verde National Park, located in southwestern Colorado. As you explore the site, look for artifacts and audio clips that will help you unravel the mystery of these cliff dwellings, as well as learn about the work of the National Park Service to maintain the site and the challenges they face in a rapidly changing climate. Okay. So here we got this little blue node thingy. Balcony House is one of our best examples of a bifurcated site, which means that you have a very prominent and well-defined architectural division. And so in this site, we have a south courtyard and a north courtyard. And this is pretty typical of contemporary Pueblo society called loyalty. The balcony is actually a common feature in these cliff dwellings. And we know hmm. that from mud lines on walls and protruding vigas from the fronts of rooms. This just happens to be one of the best preserved balconies in the park. And the balcony actually served as access to second story rooms, and it was probably a, a workspace also. When we look at the walls of this room, these are what we describe as single course uh, masonry with unshaped or semi-shaped stone. It's wet laid in mud mortar. The mortar joints are brought out flush to the wall, the outside of the wall, and we see a lot of small stones that are in the mortar joints. 
those are called chinking, and we have a theory about that, that they provide an extra bonding surface for the mortar, and also when you push them into wet mortar, they cause the mortar to expand. All right, so we did that. We got a couple, I see a couple of other nodes here, and there's also this little arrow thing, so I don't know if that means we can like look in or go inside somehow to a different scene. Let's... Uh... Mesa Verde National Park is one part of the homelands of the ancestral Pueblo people, and those homelands covered a vast area in southwest Colorado, southeastern Utah, almost all of Arizona, at least down to the Sonoran Desert part, and much of western New Mexico. It's one of the few places in America where indigenous people weren't displaced from their homelands. The Pueblo people are one of the few groups, indigenous groups, that actually live in the place they've always lived. And so that connection to the archaeological sites of this region, they call it their footprints that trace their migrations through time to where they are today in New Mexico and Arizona. 21 different sovereign tribal Pueblo nations in those two states today. Okay. Mesa Verde has approximately oh. 600 alcove sites, mm -hmm. and of those, Balcony House is in the upper 10 percentile as far as Audio, size. Audio log kept Most going. of our alcove sites are very small. They're one or two rooms, or maybe just one small storage room. I want to see what few this is of our here. Alcove sites were actually large enough. For oh. So you can go to different rooms. Okay. So I wonder if this is just a more close quarters, uh, user-friendly area. Um, like if I went back to the, um, the first monument that we were in, um, that just some of the stuff might have been far away. But this one I kind of know at least a little bit more what I'm looking for. We'll explore this a little more. I kind of want to go back and see what that other arrowed room was. During the 1200s, when this site was occupied, it wouldn't look the same as it does now. What we would see is a flat or a stepped space, because the, the roof of the kiva would have actually been level or huh. approximately level with the plaza surface around it. So what we would be walking onto is a large open space instead of an open space today that has a couple of very large holes. Kiva is an architectural form that we see in ancestral Pueblo sites in the northern San Juan region. They're typically circular or sometimes quadrilateral. The kiva that we're seeing here is it's a late series kiva. So it has what we call a banquette or a bench around the lower half of the wall and then short columns on top of the banquette they're called pilasters, and those actually supported cribbing. Okay, so let's go back to where we were. The kiva is the ritual and social center for the family, and for the site, or for a society. Oh wait, did I not? Plan. Hold on. Some of the larger kivas that we have are probably the social center for the whole community. The kivas of the Mesa Verde region are really distinctive. Oh. Pueblo people throughout the larger Pueblo world, which extends over a vast area, okay, now we can go inside. these okay, underground cool. houses. But the ones in the Mesa Verde region have a distinct shape that we call a keyhole shape. So the oh, main is chamber small. is round, but then that main chamber has a bench. Can't go down there it. at all. On the southern end, that bench is deeper and the walls flare outward. So when you look down at it, it looks like Come one on. of those Give old me. timey keyholes. There we go. Climb back out of there. And we can go this way. Can we go out any further this way? It doesn't look like it. So, um, like I said, I'll come back to these later, but uh, let us go back and I'll just give you a sneak peek at one of the other rooms. So, this is... Uh, so, each room seems to have its own... Yep, so now we're back out here. Let's go take a look at the next one. So, you know, it's really easy just to kind of sit back here and 
you know, you don't need a room scale or anything like that, but you can just check it out. Welcome to the archaeological site of Chavin de Huantar, located high in the Peruvian Andes. As you explore the site, look Neat. for artifacts and audio clips as you discover the secrets of this pre-Incan civilization and the challenges it faces today as the Andean glaciers melt at an alarming rate. Oh yeah. Okay. So this one, we got something right in front of us here. The site of Chavin, which you can see here before us, was of great importance early on in Andean archaeology, in part because it was relatively early and therefore helped establish the antiquity of Andean civilization, but also because of its art. Chavin is studded with different pieces of graphic art, including tenon heads, engraved granite plaques, and overall has more art than the average for this time period. It was one of a number of sites which appear to have been cult centers, that is, probably competing religious centers in which a series of major rituals were performed in part to attract new members to the cult. All right, so now we're kind of in this, uh, uh, how do I go back? Here we go. All right, so we are back. And we can, so there's pillars up there. I think that's telling me that there are, you know, there's different things that are going to be of interest. And we're just going to keep kind of teleporting forward here. Just to see where we can, oh, we got something over here. I see something shiny. Oh, that was just another teleport point, I think. Uh, oh, here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay, here we go. So it is kind of neat just walking around. Okay, I think we got a Falcon shiny. Falcon Gateway here we go. of Chavin is the epitome of Chavin construction, art, <coughs> and architectural formality. This gateway lies right at the head of a long axis that runs up through the main plaza, across a number of staircases, and actually quite abruptly ends right here. The gateway itself shows off Chavin's ability to cut stone. 3,000 years ago in the Andes, stone blocks, in this case granite and limestone, intentionally paired for their white and black colors respectively, were part of an architectural design, but cutting blocks this size in stone to absolute dimensions because mm. these pieces match each other perfectly in height and width. This was something new, and it's part of the grandeur of Chavin and part of its impressiveness. Someone coming here on a pilgrimage or as a potential novice to the Chavin cult probably had never seen anything quite like this. And they would have wondered, knowing these stones, whether they were in the presence of people who are using godly powers to create things on earth that they'd never seen. Something extremely interesting at Chavin is what they so did with water of their own volition. When they made water move, viewpoints they captured here. it, moved it around, made it dance, made it sound. And this, in large part, has to do with the canal system of Chavin. And we're overlooking the Rocas Canal, which is one of the largest and longest of the canal systems that we have. It underlies the entire site of Chavin. It goes underneath all the major known plazas, goes up through the terraces, and then proceeds to go under the high buildings themselves. And that suggests that that canal system was put in place for the buildings were built because there's no easy way to run these sizable underground canals underneath such a massive construction. Makes sense, not yeah. Not in Chavin's time. Okay. So now we are back. Um, I, I like the fact that you, even though it's teleport, you do sort of have free control. Um, you know, I can teleport to most open spaces. There's a little bit of... Uh, so there's another icon over there. 
But like, I don't think, see, I can't just teleport out there even though I could probably if I went down the stairs first. Like, it, I should be able to just kind of teleport, you know, wherever instead of going around. I mean, I, I sort of get what they're going for, but like for convenience sake, I wish I could just go to like whatever flat plane that I would realistically be able to walk on. Uh, let's go here. Okay, we got a whole new... Okay, so a new little area here. Wow, it's just kind of rubble, you know? It's definitely ruins. Let's take a look at one more here. The circular deposit is a very special architectural environment within the site. It had more decoration, more color pattern, and other features than any other area. The circular pause itself consists of a countersunk circle, about 19 to 20 meters in diameter, that rests right in front of Building B. Now, Building B is where the Lanzon, the surviving major cult figure in Chevy, resides. No one could see what was going on within the circular plaza because of its lower level. But it's also at the heart of Chesney. It's right in the middle of a U-shaped structure, which was very typical of this time period in the Andes. So to get here, you would have had to have traversed a number of staircases, gone across a number of platform levels within the site, and you would find yourself really at the entry point to a staircase leading up to the Lanzone Chamber. The main feature of decoration for the circular plaza are these so large... Look at this really fast. Deep inside the heart of one of the buildings of Chavin is the Lanzone. The Lanzone is a granite huh. monolith about four and a half meters tall. Okay, so that I can't is really look at over anything else except for with this. With the image of a single creature, really a humanoid, something like a human, that has the very characteristics, fangs in the mouth, snakes for hair, paws on the hands and such. It's a central figure. It's central within its gallery. And this gallery itself is right on an axis running through the circular plaza to the east. It's intrinsically important, even where it is, and has often been referred to as some sort of an axis mundi. The place that Chavin revolved around. All right, anyway. This is the shaft that it revolved around. Oh, I can actually get closer to it. Okay. All right, so there is your kind of look at... Um, let's back to our main menu, and I think we have one more. I'll just give you the sneak peek, but we'll wrap it up here pretty shortly. And I'll just let you see at least some of the uh, beginnings of this thing. But you get the idea. I wish that some of the stuff stood out a little bit more. Um, these other sites haven't been too bad. But Mount Rushmore, I kind of wish. Welcome to the historic city of Ayutthaya, I almost the ancient back capital there of again. Thailand until it was sacked by the Burmese in the 18th century, and the capital moved to Bangkok. You will find artifacts and audio clips as you uncover the story of this city located at the confluence of three rivers and at the mercy of a rapidly changing and unpredictable climate. Um, so I kind of like, I almost want to go back to the Mount Rushmore just because. You know, I was trapped in that little area, but now that I've, again, I've looked at other sites and I can maybe find a way to get more, you know, to get around that space a little bit more because you have to think you're not just trapped there. Um, but, you know, it's fun just kind of looking at the architecture. I mean, look at the intricacies of this crazy, like, um... I'm trying to think of what you would even call this, like this rounded, pointed uh, structure here. Uh, let's just walk around a little bit. I don't know that I'm necessarily going to do a bunch of audio logs in this one right now, but I do want to at least be able to just... Let's go up these stairs because that seems like a cool thing to do. I just want to walk around the structure a little bit so you guys can see how it is uh, rendered and everything, what we can look at here. Can I go this way? Oh, I can. Oh no, I can't go. Oh, I want to go in there. Come on, let me go in there. Really? Alright. Um, let's see. 
I can go here. Okay, now I'm back. Yeah, this is back where we started. Uh, let's go down this way because I see there's another pillar up this way. I think there's some more. Is there more stairs? Yep. Oh, that's really big. Again, I wish I could just freely walk. Uh oh, how did I do that? Uh, I totally disoriented myself and moved somehow. Uh, I kind of wish I had more full freedom of movement. And I could go a few more places, but... You know, for educational-wise, I mean, it's still it's still really neat. And, you know, this absolutely beats just looking at something in... Uh, you know, I mean, it's fun to read about it in a textbook or something like that, if, if they wrote it well. But, you know, actually being here, this would actually work as a good supplement to... Uh, I could see, like, a history class or something like that. You know, if you're talking about... Um, you know, we've talked about like uh, some of the Indian civil uh, Indian tribes and stuff like that, and all these different people and monuments around the world. You know, to be able to explore all of this stuff. You know, this is probably the closest thing most of us are going to get to actually being here. In the case of Utah, there has been a concern raised by the World Heritage Committee that the lessons learned from the flood really need to be integrated into improving the level oh, of conservation practice, nicer. and also in terms of forward planning as well within the site management authorities. So the World Heritage Committee has issued recommendations, one of them having to do with kind of forward-looking disaster risk planning for the site. And the very first step of that, of course, is hazard assessments in order to calculate risks then to come up with mitigation measures, emergency preparedness measures, and then sort of recovery guidelines for how to deal with problems. And it's clear that for UTF, this is going to be a recurrent issue. Okay. We'll go back. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so this is kind of, a, you know, I mean, I should, I really hope to, you know, in my lifetime, especially since I'm pretty, you know, fairly close to it, I would, I would love to get to like the Black Hills and Mount Rushmore because it is geographically close enough by. I know my parents would love to go there. So, you know, maybe one summer or something I would love to be able to, you know, even if I had to help them financially or something during uh, what little downtime they have during that time of the year. If, hey, you know, even if we met up there, um, you know, I took a train somewhere or whatever and we met to go see some of these different types of uh, historical monuments and sites like that. Um, you know, the stuff that's around the world, probably not going to go get to see something like this. Um, but again, you know, it's something that uh, people can at least virtually have the chance to see. So we'll get out of here and back into the museum. And this is, so like I said, this is our, ma um, what the heck did they call it? <laughs> it is from Master World, um, Master World's Journey Through History Museum. If you're into history, if you want something a little more educational, and again, it's something that's a bit more relaxing, um, I would say this is a pretty decent, uh, pretty good app you might want to look into. As for low vision, there are a bit of issues, especially, like I said, getting around that first uh, Mount Rushmore was a little bit interesting. Being able to read some of the pop-ups as far as for like the audio logs or that little pause menu. Luckily, I guessed correctly and I just clicked. I'm like, well, quit is probably over here. Uh, and I was able to return back to our main museum area here. But, uh, so, you know, just like a lot of VR experiences, a lot of VR games, there are some, especially interface issues. Um, but if you're willing to experiment a little bit, play around with them, I mean, you're hopefully not really going to break anything. Um, the only time I ever remember doing that, there was a game that I was playing 
and I was trying to figure out how to go. I was trying to figure out if there were other like movement options and things. And I forget what game it was, but there were, they had multiple languages in it. And I somehow turned everything into another language. And then I had to figure out, okay, how in the hell did I do that? And how do I get it back? <laughs> Eventually I did get it back to normal, uh, to English. But, uh, that was one of the only things I think that I, you know, as far as really messed up something in the interface, but I mean, largely, you know, especially if you're familiar with user interface design, you know, like, oh, the top of the menu is this, or the center is usually this, or the bottom is usually quit, those types of things. So, um, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this short glimpse at uh, this journey through history. Follow me on Twitter at BGFH79. Definitely be back for more accessible and mainstream games and VR content in the future. And uh, until next time, I will talk to you guys again later.